Hello, and welcome to the virtual Nordic and Baltic Oscar Contender Series presented by Scandinavios in New York and the Scandinavian Film Festival of Los Angeles, along with the Baltic Film Expo at SFFLA. We are pleased to offer virtual screenings of films chosen by the Nordic and Baltic countries to compete for the Oscar nomination for Best International Feature Film category. These films are available to viewers across the US on the weekends of January 7th, the 14th, and the 21st. Today, we are speaking with director Carl Kalpis from the official uh, Lithuanian nomination, Nova Lithuania. And a special thanks goes out to the Embassy of Lithuania in the US and the Consulate Generals of Lithuania in New York and in Los Angeles for helping making the screening possible. Karlolis was born in Vilnius in 1987, uh, graduated from the Vilnius University with an MA in comparative politics. His, his, his first short film, The Noisemaker, was selected at the Larcano Film Festival and is screened at more than 50 international film festivals and won two Lithuanian Film Academy Awards. His second short film, Watchkeeping, premiered at the Indy Lisbo Film Festival and was selected to 20 international film festivals. Novo Lithuania is his debut feature film. Moderating today's talk is Lukas Brzezinski, a film and media scholar, curator, and teacher based in New York with a concentration in Baltic cinema. So please welcome everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Carlos. Um, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, yeah, it's actually my pleasure to chat with Carlos about his really long-awaited film, Nova Lithuania, and uh, Nova Lithuania. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think we should just get to start. And uh, I want to start from the very beginning, uh, because like uh, we uh, supposedly already know what the film is about generally and uh, while discussing films uh, dealing with the historical past uh, I always face this kind of danger to focus on the history too much and and leave the film aside so I will try not to do it today but uh, for the beginning uh, I want to ask very general question uh, about uh, the prehistory of the film and specifically because the life and the ideas of Katis Pakshtas, the film has taken as a sort of core uh, storyline are really remarkable. And I fully sure that it, they could be discussed on their own. Um, uh, and since people who do not live in Lithuania might not have heard much about Pakshtas, uh, I would like to start this conversation asking you just uh, about uh, what has really drawn you to the story of Pakshtas. And how did you develop an interest in his personality and the days he spent in Lithuania before the Second World War? Uh, basically, how and when did this project of the film begin? So I would say that in Lithuania, he became famous after uh, a play by Marius Ivashkevichus appeared, which was called Madagascaras Madagascar. Uh, and I was in my late teens when I saw the play and uh, it was, I would say it was an event in Lithuanian theater because that was probably the first play talking about interwar history and interwar history, at least in, 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 in early 2000, wasn't something that people would talk about much because it was still a very much post-Soviet, post-Soviet, Soviet times, 50, 50 years or so time. So, uh that was something new and then i i, I dove into his his uh, his writings and and his bio and it's a rich bio just as you said uh, the man was born in in, in late 800 and and then moved to seeking for higher education in in U united states then came back to lithuania basically created the science of geography uh, uh, which was uh, uh, done completely from scratch, and uh, and then again uh, moved uh, to 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 West Coast uh, when the occupation took place, and and remained there until his death in in ninety sixty. So uh, that's a rich history. But um, basically, what interests me from the beginning in the ideas of this man was was uh, the fact that they were distinctive in, in a sense i felt that there is an artist uh, hiding behind a scientist or or geopolitician whatever you call him 
somebody who would always be a, a, a white sheep among uh, a black sheep among white sheep. Do they say so? Uh, so so yeah, a black sheep among white sheep, and and that was also his curse. Uh, at the same time, uh, lots of. Uh, particular ideas, Reserve Lithuania was just one of them. There were many more things about moving the whole country towards uh, the sea, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but Reserve Lithuania was something that, uh, I don't know, rang a bell because, uh, because it rings a bell to, to, to people who expect that somewhere there is a land, you know, or, or a place or a time or, or a person with whom, where, in, in, what, in which time, it would be totally different from where we are now. So uh, that was probably the, the main idea. But then when I needed to turn it into film and, and to write a script on that, that was already another, another story. And, and I needed to somehow concentrate the whole of this rich life into something very strict and, 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 and short in a sense. I was at the workshop of, of Andrzej Vajda in, in Warsaw. Uh, at that time, the script, I think it dragged for like 30 years of his life. And then um, Vajda told me after reading the script, he told me that you need to decide whether you are making film leading to apocalypse or post-apocalyptic film. You cannot make apocalypse in the middle of the script and then go on as if nothing happens. So, uh, that was a useful advice for me. And then I concentrated on those last year or two years before everything ends as it, as it used to be. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's other stories actually what also interests me a lot, uh, what followed the idea to make a film about uh, Parkstas. And I think uh, uh, here we can talk about a few things, uh, but one specifically uh, interesting uh, is uh, the way to make a film about uh, important history for the country uh, and for the region, uh, like through looking at, uh, you know, specific, you know, uh, personality uh, that is in the center of the film, which is like geographer uh, Gruadis slash Pakshtas, uh, like, and I was thinking about that, uh, and uh, at first sight, one could see your film as a sort of representing, uh, you know, what we call historical film genre, the film that uh, sort of tries to retell important uh, historical events, like narrativize them, uh, 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 although, from my view, uh, Nova Lithuania does not aim what many historical films, so-called historical reconstructions, aim at uh, uh, specifically to, to literally rec reconstruct the historical period uh, and follow a certain, you know, dominant narrative of history. In many of these films, uh, we see this so-called heroic representations uh, uh, of the past, uh, just supporting what uh, we all know the dominant sort of line of history and what I feel uh, you have done uh, here uh, is uh, a bit uh, different uh, way of telling history which is almost like a uh, in between you know um, historical facts and certain kind of fictional uh, uh, reimagination of the history through the characters that do not look like uh, uh, written on stone. They do not look like those uh, heroes we read about in the textbooks uh, at high school. They, uh, you know, they have a lot of humane uh, traits. Uh, they have all humanist sort of flaws and starting from, of course, the main character, uh, because it's Pakshtas, uh, but also going to, you know, the leaders of the country, uh, like the president and prime minister, they do not look like uh, these heroic personalities sometimes uh, uh, we deal with in, in, in the sort of uh, official representations of history, but at the same time, they look way more realistic. Uh, and so I just uh, uh, wanted to, to ask you about uh, how did you come up with this, you know, this way of uh, uh, telling uh, the story about the interwar, like last years of the interwar period uh, in Lithuania. Um, and did you face some challenges, uh, both from, you know, 
sort of people who expect still this heroic narratives to be retold and as well as maybe from you know dealing with the genre like video genre which i know you have not worked with before in your short films that were more about contemporary Lithuania. when you read a history textbook let's say uh, when you're in high school and you read history at least i used to do that I would always skip the pages that are about to tell the reasons for something to happen. And then I just read what happens, you know, and this happening or what is supposed to be important in history, you know, the action. Uh, so we have reasons for the Second World War, which are, again, you never can have a full list of the reasons. But those pages, they reading a history textbook, they are the least interesting uh, because uh, yeah, there are all these small reasons, but then you have action and an action in the film always drags you, drags your interest. I mean, for general audiences, but, uh, but then I think that what is action or what is already symbolically important in history, then in the film, you can also only repeat those things or you would just, how to put it, you know, you, you just, turn them into marble, into one big chunk of marble, which are already in it, while things happening until, or things happening immediately after that, are usually in some kind of a black hole. And, and that's why they, they seem way more interesting to me. Then again, uh, when we talk about the past, the only reason having in mind the, how much money it costs to make a, a film based in, in some period. The only reason to make it is, is uh, the only reason to make it is, is only if you, if, you, if you find something that correlates to today. Otherwise, I'm just emphasizing this stereotype that past is something that happened and it's done and it's there, the linear perspective, which I don't really sign up much to. I think it's pretty much circular and uh, things keep on repeating. And uh, it doesn't mean that if we are far away from events, they are somehow distant from us. Usually there are periods in history that are way closer to us, despite the fact that they are far away on the linear line. This seems, pretty much the case with the interwar period. Uh, I'm talking about Lithuania here. It's pretty, maybe in different places, it's, 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 it's different. But here, these, these years when the country is already, already being taken for granted, when, when there is a general prosperity, you know, and, and then also some kind of shady fear for the future, what is about to happen, what this small entity is about to go through when big things are happening in the world, you know, and, and we cannot change them and they only impact us, we do not impact them, etc., etc. That's why it was mostly interesting to go in, into this. And then I think recreating or trying to portray this particular period, it's not important to have exact characters or exact events. The, what cinema can portray is a, is a feeling, a dominating emotion. I mean, a kind of a non-verbal non tension, something that people don't actually talk about, but all of them commonly feel. Uh, so, you know, in history books, it's, it's diff historians don't really talk about that that much. Maybe it's more of a field of phenomenology or, or, or something, you know, but, but uh, my goal was more to understand this, this emotion that once again, I found it in the, in the writings of, of, of my alter ego, of my main character, where he says, you know, I cannot say what exactly is about to happen. I cannot say what is exactly wrong, <laughs> but the feeling is not good. And uh, in the recent years, I mean, in the last five years, when things were happening in Ukraine, uh, et cetera, 
I had that feeling. I felt it uh, back home here. And then I, I thought that is exactly what connects us to that period. Thanks for this. Uh, I, I just uh, following it up, uh, I thought uh, um, a lot while watching the film uh, about your decision uh, not to name uh, the historical personalities uh, by their real names. And even the, like Lithuanians, uh, I believe like almost uh, all who has like basic uh, uh, historical knowledge recognize that like the president is like the president and Anas Matonas, the, uh, you know, uh, is Spakštas uh, and so on and so forth. And if you, dig a bit deeper even into you know what's going on in the film uh, you know changes of prime ministers and everything else like you you realize i realize that like you follow certain like real uh, events uh, that were happening in that same period but the decision was uh, uh, to have a kind of uh, characters that do not refer like uh, directly to, to the real historical figures. And then you said now about uh, the feeling and, and the sort of almost phenomenological impact of the film on the spectators that do not have this historical context. Uh, uh, was it uh, one of the reasons like to, on the one hand, deal with the history, on the other hand, not to, you know, be um, too explicit uh, uh, in basically making a, sort of dispute with historians, uh, having, you know, the real historical personalities portrayed? Uh, naturally, that foreign audience doesn't care about, I mean, what names are of those characters. As, uh, as the introducer said, they are unpronounceable anyways. <laughs> so, so that's mostly, yeah, this touch is a Lithuanian audience. And what I saw in Lithuania in last years, when, whenever a film uh, touching a historical topic appears, you know, there's always this overwhelming discussion about whether it's true or not, whether it's authentic or not. And then the audience divides itself into two parts. Somebody say that uh, doesn't matter what and how the film is, what matters is that somebody made a film about it. Or uh, then there is another I would say extremity where people would say that oh, this topic, you cannot make a normal film about that topic. It's, it's too banal to, I think there are no bad topics in general. There is just a question of how you put it. But uh, I think that if, if, uh, if you choose, uh, there are these kind of biographical films that are, do nothing else except analyzing the, the personality maybe then you can name them in, 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 in exact names, but otherwise you just drag the, the audience into this dispute, whether he was with a beard or not, whether mustache is of a particular form, you know, like uh, totally irrelative questions to, to the film. So I thought, and this discussion continues after the film is shown. It continues in, in reviews and in discussions are like, it just drives your attention to somewhere else. And as, as recently in Lithuania, we had cases where the whole discussion of, uh, let's say a, a written piece or, or a film was about uh, these irrelative and from my point of view things. I just thought I, I won't do that. And at the same time, I think there is another reason that, well, these are film characters. They are not true human beings. And in a feature film, I am never able to show the full perspective of, of a human being, all the contradictions possible and everything. You still, you sum it up into certain features, you know, a set of features that are shown in the film. And uh, those are never, enough to show a human being before i think it's fair to make a character and with a fictional name even though they are inspired by by the actual uh, personality 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and like following what you said, let's let's maybe go let's go closer to the film itself instead of just talking about the historical analysis. We might come back here uh, later, but uh, I'm also very interested in uh, hearing a bit more about the development uh, of the story and 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 specifically, you know, the way uh, characters uh, are represented. There are like many levels to discuss here, I believe. Uh, but on the one hand, uh, you have this. Um, a parallel between you know the uh, official sort of professional uh, lives uh, of all the characters uh, uh, and uh, their sort of personal lives and 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 personal lives uh, uh, they are especially talking about the geographer about Grodis uh, uh, pretty complicated uh, uh, and uh, the film uh, to in my view, uh, very intentionally do not draw the distinction between the two and this sort of human uh, life is injected into, you know, what we actually know about these people if we know them as a historical uh, personalities. And uh, this was usually left aside if you look at the history books, uh, uh, but here you specifically like try to make them human. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I've, everyone probably thought uh, about uh, mo their motivations in kind of more bro broader uh, uh, spectrum uh, than they face with sort of personal life stories, like in Pakshas or in Grodis way, like everyone probably thought like, is he really want to save Lithuania or maybe he just want to save his uh, marriage or something, you know, or how it is related, how it's inseparable. So um, could you tell a bit more about the development of the story and uh, did you come up with this idea to sort of focus on the personal and the sort of uh, official size of the characters from the very beginning or like how, why, why it's important for you? Uh, I, I, I remember uh, in my early university years, I liked uh, a Romanian philosopher, Emil Cioran, very much. And I read a lot of his uh, writings, his books, which are, as you probably know, mostly nihilist. And it's mostly about that suicide is the only way to deal with life, uh, the only way to escape this meaningless hole and et cetera, et cetera. And what struck me the most was when I found the, the fact uh, that speaking about that for the whole of his life, he just ends up his life uh, peacefully dying, being 80 or something years old. And then his wife uh, that was supporting him just gathers all his writings, brings them to the publisher and commits suicide. Uh, although he, he was somebody who would refuse the uh, Premier Goncourt and uh, all the, the financial side of, of the world, you know, it doesn't exist, it's not important. Uh, I'm talking about this because I, I think there is always a big, sometimes, not in all cases, but there is a big gap or, or big, uh, big emptiness between what you say, <laughs> what you preach and, and whether you live that or not. Uh, and in, in Grody's case, or in Pakshta's case, in the original case of his, once again, when you read about what he says, that's one thing. What, when you read what he lived, that's another thing. Uh, you cannot answer, in my, from my perspective, you cannot answer the question whether he's trying to save a country or his family, because he cannot answer the question himself. And I found enough of document documentary of factual information that that proved me to you know he moved to 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 the states in, in 1939 and and then they separated with his wife and up till the end of of her days because she died of cancer i think in late 50s or mid 50s on the east coast and he was living on the west coast they never met again but i found these letters where he kept on writing her that I'll, I'll be, build you a beautiful house on the west coast here in Santa Monica and it will have a be beautiful view on the ocean. And, and he never does anything, you know, to, to go there. And it's almost the same with the alternative Lithuania. He keeps on preaching the idea 
gets ridiculed by Lithuanian diaspora in, in different meetings all over the country. They treat him as almost an, an a entertainer, you know, uh, not a, a serious geopolitician. But you cannot say whether he is just trying to save the dream, which he knows that if, if he destroys it, then his life is meaningless anymore because he already lost the real country. It a bit reminds you the the I don't know the philosophy of Jonas Mekas, you know, uh, when you lose everything and and then you just you know you just try to find meaning in in pictures in in some small details in in, in something that is present here and now, just right now. Uh, just for him, all of that comes from from his dreams. What it would be? What if? Uh, so I thought it, it would be a, a, too much to, to leave that part uh, uh, aside, you know, and uh, the strange thing or the paradox is that this family part is the most factually correct. I mean, it, it, it is the most real, uh, uh, basically fictionalized nothing. I just, uh, except, I mean, dialogues or, or something, but, but uh, Indeed, there was this mother-in-law that came there, and, and indeed, uh, she was trying to to separate them in the last years, pretending she's seeking for some land lot, you know, in uh, in Lithuania to purchase. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, it cannot be separated. Therefore, before I included it into into the film, and naturally, then again, there is this. Uh, simpler answer to this, uh, you know, the, the smaller entity, bigger entity, country, family, one gets invaded, another gets invaded, and something like that. Avoid emptiness in both of them, emptiness that's, according to his writings, attracts uh, fullness, as he said. Yeah, um, I was thinking also about uh... You know the, the 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 content of what you said, uh, uh, Gruadis or Paxta's dreams are, and uh, I like uh, knew about Paxta's for a long time because I'm Lithuanian, and now I watching rewatching the film, I was thinking, okay, if I were from you know somewhere else, uh, I would probably struggle a bit, like you know, kind of understanding. Um, What's going on here? <laughs> In a way that uh, uh, you know, uh, as we discussed, you, know, you have to know the Lithuanian history to really, you know, understand better. You know, like what is at stake, uh, the small country, and and all these ideas coming uh, to Pakshta's uh, head uh, in regard to sort of saving the country in this strange geopolitical situation. But on the other hand, like uh, you cannot help but uh, uh, sort of think about is it like a, some kind of colonial project? You know, like when you just have the privilege to travel all around the world and 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 look for places for you know moving, you know, having money to like having, having that goal to move people. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, but like, of course, uh, uh, that's, I thought uh, somebody could uh, come up uh, without the context uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, I uh, know that at that time there was a like uh, immigration uh, happening, it's like it's a real thing already in the interwar period and a lot of Lithuanians were uh, uh, like literally, uh, moving to the states and uh, other places uh, and it almost seems on the other hand that it could be a kind of and this idea of you know so-called global uh, Lithuania or like global world where you would have like uh, uh, people freely moving being you know having connection with uh, like a mainland <laughs> and then, so um, but like uh, I, 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 I just for the sort of clarity I think in, in terms of understanding these ideas I want you to also share your um, impressions on what really uh, uh, according to your, you know, research and understanding, Pakshtas was uh, 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 up to. As you probably saw in the film, I was trying to avoid the topic of where is it and how it looks exactly and, and how it should be implemented. It's not really the point in, in the film, I think. Uh, 
according to my research, uh, his perspective or his understanding about this alternative Lithuania was more of a cultural isolation, I would say, because he himself being the member of, of Lithuanian diaspora in Chicago in, in early 900, uh, saw that, let's say, second or third generation would, would uh, assimilate, and he found that to be problematic. And what it seemed to me that what he was seeking was truly some kind of an isolated place where you would have no big neighbors close to. Uh, and uh, the problem is that you don't have that place anywhere in the world already in 1930s, although it's still a, let's say, let's call it a colonial time, you know, when, when the idea is still legit in that time. Uh, so, uh, everything he writes and wherever he goes and when he, he tries to adapt his idea to some particular place at the end he comes to conclusion that it doesn't it's not good enough or it doesn't fit or it's not suitable we need to keep on looking but he never finds any one i mean uh, in his last years in in 1950s he was uh, checking out what british honduras but then uh, but then Brits uh, <laughs> left uh, and, and he basically switched to Bahamas and was thinking about purchasing them from United States, but uh, then maybe just a chunk, you know, it's never, it's never a definite idea. But what he's trying to avoid too is, yeah, is a disappearance of a culture, of an identity, disappearance of, uh, of this nation, disappearance of, of some kind of particular mentality, which although he criticizes much, the, there is no bigger, you know, he is wiping the, the, all the national faults that the Lithuanians have from provinciality and uneducation, et cetera, et cetera, what, what he sees as a, as a drawbacks of, of interwar uh, Lithuania. But um, uh, when film appeared, I had this fear that it will be misunderstood or not understood at all in, in foreign countries due to the lack of historical context. And I thought at the beginning that the film would go better in some Eastern European countries that share common past or share the history. But it was different. Uh, it was unexpected that film went to places and, and was somehow even well received or better received in, in places that share post-colonial past or let's call it, a, they are countries that are on the boundary of, of mainstream histories, on the boundaries or I don't know, Kurdistan or, or or some places that uh, are still struggling and experiencing these problems. So uh, when the film went on Mubi and it was available all over the world, because that was probably the biggest reach that we had, except festivals. I, I did my little anthropological research just by you know typing in Nova Lithuania in, in Twitter and just checking out what people speak about it. And, and I was surprised to, to find that uh, in places where I thought it would be totally, you know, I don't know, Uruguay or 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 Turkey or or something, they somehow contacted, attached themselves to it or, or, or saw themselves in the film and understood it perfectly, despite the fact that they lack the knowledge of, of these details, you know, the historical context. While in uh, in any bigger European country, let's say Great Britain, it gets totally misunderstood or not understood or people don't understand what the hell is happening and why do we do they need to, sh to see that so i think once again i'm talking about uh, a feeling uh, i think if you have the feeling if you have a kind of maybe it would sound banal but if you know what existential threat is if you know what is a fear of that someday you are there and someday you are not then you you find yourself easier in this film while for a bigger country where as a normal person would never you know question the fact that whether france is going to disappear from the you know surface of the earth well they, they never think about it 
then uh, they don't really understand how 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 to see this film and how to understand it. They they think nothing is happening. They don't get the feeling. If you don't get the feeling that you know, you lack action, etc. So uh, yeah, I, I saw that uh, film traveled well and 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 was well accepted in in strange places that were totally unexpected for me. While let's say. Uh, countries that share uh, the past, maybe they see too much of themselves in it and, and they don't really, I mean, besides the Baltics, let's say in Eastern Europe, it wasn't that uh, well received. Getting even closer to the film, uh, I, it uh, uh, apparently covers like uh, the period of 38 and 39. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I was uh, also interested in, in, in what you, um, like how you construct the story. Uh, on the one hand, we talked about the characters and, and this sort of different, like complex uh, portrayal of them. Uh, but then there is this uh, period uh, thing and uh, we who know uh, the historical context, uh, we understand you know, what follows after the film ends uh, uh, almost uh, not abruptly, but like uh, kind of, uh, let's say, cut in the story, right? And 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 the cut in the story symbolically, uh, I believe, uh, happens uh, at the time when the president uh, learns about uh, uh, what we could consider almost the beginning of the uh, uh, Soviet times uh, of Lithuania or Soviet uh, occupation, which was not, uh, as we all know from history, uh, you know, like literally like violent occupation, uh, but that was a uh, very uh, complex uh, and uh, now widely discussed among historians, uh, kind of almost cunning move from uh, the Soviets uh, to, 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 to reach an agreement uh, which was more like an ultimatum, right? And, and the president uh, uh, let it happen. And then we have a cut, even though from the history, we know that like uh, uh, there's, there's something happened later, you know, like the president himself escaped and all this like started, <laughs> like I was somehow when I first watched the film, I was like kind of thinking about like president. I, I remember all these myths, like uh, I read somewhere that like president was running away and passing by some like rivers like almost like in the border like like no you cut here uh and so why it was important to end the film here uh, uh at this moment uh, before actually that sort of soviet history of lithuania starts because that's where that's where the uh, textbook uh, history of occupation starts and i think that's mm -hmm. that's the godot coming you don't show the godot you know otherwise you you destroy the picture of it, uh, which you was trying to build throughout the film, you know? So that's mainly the reason. I, I even had a scene where uh, Red Army is, uh, is in his house in the same apartment, you know, where they are dragging a piano through the floor and, and making this big scratch on the floor. But, uh, but then when we had it in the editing, uh, I mean, when, when we tried it on as, a, as an ending, it seemed super moralistic and like totally destroys what I was trying to build. You know, you had just try suddenly revealing the, uh, this big uh, uh, other somebody you're afraid of or, or I mean, it doesn't work uh, this way. And, and that's the, probably the, the, the biggest difference between cinema and, and, and history as a subject as a matter, you know, that uh, yes, all those details are super important when historians are discussing what happened. But in this film, they are not important anymore. Uh, they start happening and that's where possibility <laughs> for this idea, possibility to do something disappears as well. Yeah, I honestly loved that ending uh, and sort of how open is for the audience to really, uh, but with knowing or without knowing, uh, work on, 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 on what had been shown. And also it reminded me, uh, you know, this so-called, some people call it neorealist style of contemporary cinema, but like it's very often related to some 
film movements like uh, Romania New Wave. And I know personally that you uh, are interested. Is it, you really had some interest at least <laughs> in, in Romania New Wave. And, and from your early shorts, you can feel it. Uh, and I know you worked with some directors, I think rather Chude, right? Like, um, uh, so uh, also I was thinking about uh, somehow, uh, strangely enough, uh, about uh, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, like the satire of uh, American government, uh, you know, like basically facing the nuclear war uh, and, and, and also like exposing uh, themselves as like very uh, humane, like full of humane flaws characters. Uh, like, yeah, maybe, maybe you want to reveal like what were the influences uh, for this film or like very generally for your own, you know, uh, film filmmaking sort of uh, uh, path, uh, uh, what kind of films and ways of storytelling you appreciate? Uh, you're right. I was very much impressed by, by Romanian New Way when it appeared and I thought that was a uh, you know, a kind of Italian you know, realism appear, reappearing in Eastern Europe again, when you would use the circumstances you have instead of waiting for circumstances to be good, you know. Uh, but I think the time of it has passed. Uh, and uh, and I, I actually saw a lot of this trying to repeat uh, a, a Romanian new wave in different Eastern European countries and making the same type of, you know, realist uh, films uh, from, let's say, Bulgaria to, to Estonia. And I think it, it has passed. It, it's a bit outdated already. Uh, therefore, I, 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 I wish to find a certain style that would be more authentic and and in this film we worked a lot with um with the dup basically we 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 kept on digging interwar photos the the photographies of uh official ceremonies uh, official uh, journalism and magazines and how that time was portrayed by a photographer of that time how did they see because it's important to see what people see and what you see in those times because they don't have the knowledge i do have of, of the past and we found this guy whose name is Vito Tas Augustinas another, another emigre who, who left Lithuania during the occupation uh, when when Soviets were coming back in 1944 he, he left the United States and also died there. And uh, he was interesting because he, he usually he presses the, the camera button two seconds early or two seconds later and it is, you are supposed to press it in an official ceremony. Likewise, catches something that is not supposed to go into the, sh into the frame, you know, uh, uh, somebody blowing his nose or picking up some, you know, some uh, daily routine of an official that is supposed to be um, a symbol, not a human being. Uh, and that drags us closer to, to the government, the authorities, uh, etc. In Augustina's photos, he, I mean, I could talk a lot about uh, why I think his style is, it was suitable for us, having in mind that it's a debut film with a limited budget in a different period, difficult period from a point of shooting because in Lithuania, we don't have much of that interwar prop stuff, you know, everything has vanished. So we need to bring either make it a new or, or bring it from let's say Barandov Studios in Prague which we did with the costumes of the film. So uh, photography, uh, interwar photography was mainly the, the... Yeah here I have another question which I was about to ask uh, in regard to same probably that's the same answer uh, like in regard to style of the film you shot it uh on pretty unusual of four to three aspect ratio uh and this black and white of course uh was it also because you were inspired by augustina's photographers uh, or like wh what the conceptual uh reasoning uh, behind those two decisions black and white and aspect ratio so augustina's he shoots 
mm, usually he shoots one on one. It's just a rectangular <laughs> thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it works well because he he usually would point the camera that way that uh, he would leave certain things out of the frame by uh, letting us understand that there is more. I just don't show you that. And he would cut a person, let's say, in half and would have a line of, I don't know, seven people and the seventh would be cut in a half. And you don't know how many more are there. If, if, probably there are only seven. <laughs> but, uh, but likewise, we don't understand whether this line is going to continue for, for, I don't know, a hundred persons more. And in a film where you have a limited budget for extras, etc., that works well. Then another thing is is uh, what he's usually doing is is uh, uh, he's trying to the object that he has in the frame, uh, and he would treat it as a, as the most important object or a person of the frame. He would hide it until something uh, relatively unimportant on the on the first. Uh, uh, how you call it in English? Uh, primo piano, primo planos. Uh, first, like uh, front, 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 yeah. Plane, first plane, yeah. If, if you have a focus, right? You, you yeah. have a deep, deep focus. So on the first place, you would have something unimportant. Then you would have something important, mm -hmm. but something unimportant would be hiding it. So you have a desire to like peep over the shoulder so that you would see what he wants to show us. And uh, there are a lot of these small secrets that Augustinus does when he shoots, when he photographs. And it helped us a lot having in mind that we need to show emptiness and we need to use emptiness as a style in order, in order to show that it is supposed to be like that. Uh, and not to show that, you know, we lack money and <laughs> we didn't have enough of it. It's a pretty, as you see, it's an interior film. You have only certain places where you can shoot outside and they are all strictly two centimeters here and not here because up here we have already a glass building starting. So it needed to be a photographic film where camera doesn't move much. Uh, black and white, again, uh, I think that when you withdraw to two colors only, then you, you fantasize more. You use your fantasy more than having all the colors. So black and white has different shades and then shades become important, chiaroscuro, the, the dark, dark and white spots and everything. But as well, there was a very simple reason that you save money and then you don't care about colors of things that Again, colors cost money if you want particular color and in a colored film, you mat they matter. You, you need to choose particular you know, colors while, while here it was easier to go into interiors which we couldn't decorate and you. And uh, in black and white, you just don't see uh, much, uh, as much as you would see in a color. So there are always these, uh, Let's say I have a conceptual answer to everything, but sometimes the answers are also very simple to, to these decisions. Okay. Thank you for the sincerity, because I, I found the film really uh, doing very well in sort of reconstructing the period without those failures some films with low budget have, then you're like so, super uh, not convinced about, you know, what do you see? Like, <laughs> and, and of course all these things uh, help. So it's very interesting to know more about uh, your production decisions as well. Uh, the actors, I also uh, want to ask a question about. Uh, I found the uh, uh, acting very, uh, also uh, sort of nice, uh, uh, avoiding uh, the problem some Lithuanians films sometimes have when actors coming from the theater sort of overacting or like really um, not uh, working well uh, in films, even though they are known actors. So you had uh, uh, the, 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 the Valentino Sorimosalskis uh, 
the actor whom you already collaborated in your short film, uh, but when you had two other actors, I think Alexis Kazanavich was who played uh, uh, the geographer uh, and uh, uh, Vaidotas uh, Martinaitis. Uh, could you, I mean, they're all kind of known actors. Uh, could you tell uh, more about uh, your uh, collaboration, your work together, uh, and how you managed to get this uh, uh, nice energy between them. I specifically liked the sort of energy between the uh, president and the prime minister. <laughs> Look like really, I mean, because it's a great, but also having this uh, comical or satiric effect as well. I mean, certainly it's a small country where all the actors already have some kind of chemistry between them due to common work and in theater or in previous films. So it's not that difficult when you finally pair them or, or you would just put them together. They already have something and you just try it on and you see how they work together. Uh, in Lithuania, we have as many actors as we have and you can cast for a feature film, you can cast them all, basically. <laughs> it's not that difficult to, to cast all the actors available that you can get and, and then choose from them. So let's say with a, with a main character, uh, I, I, I tried it on with, with Alexis for a single scene and then didn't cast anymore because I, I kind of knew him from previous works in, in, in film and theater. And I, I knew that he can do that. Well, let's say for the, for, yeah, Masalskis as well, I thought, okay, president, I'm, I'm just gonna pick him up. I think he will do it fine. Uh, as for the prime minister, we did a pretty big casting, I don't know, 30 or 30, yeah, I think it was about 30 men we tried and, and, and Martinaitis was the first, he did it best. So uh, there is nothing deeply particular about the casting them separately, but then, but then uh, I always try to, you know, to think about peers and how they're gonna go together because it's always about relationship and the dialogue, whether you, you believe that these people can be, I don't know, friends or colleagues or, or, or characters you are implying them to be on the script or not sometimes it just doesn't work and separately it can be a good actor but when you stick them together it just doesn't work there's no chemistry i think we are about to wrap it up as, as they yeah yeah up. I think so. We, it, we are almost one hour, but I, I, I want to end with like two very, I mean, quick questions. One is like, which that I know the reason we're talking here uh, uh, is that uh, your film uh, is nominated uh, for the Academy Awards uh, from Lithuania. So uh, my question is like, what does it mean for you? Um, it's a... Uh... Uh, big recognition. I mean, and, and a huge surprise as well, because uh, I wasn't thinking about any awards at all. Uh, making this film, it's a f first feature film. I was uh, merely trying to make it. <laughs> so, so that was a big surprise and I was really happy. Yeah, and maybe like to wrap it up, maybe you want to reveal your next projects. Are you working on something right now? Will it be another feature film or something else? Yeah, I'm working on a feature film. It's going to be another period piece, but this time it's going to be year 1991. Just immediately uh, after the January 13, which was uh, this attempt, the last Soviet attempt to make a coup d'etat and, and suck uh, uh, its back into the, into the big empire. But uh, the film is, should be about a hunger strike of uh, TV employees, uh, which they did uh, trying to claim back the television, which was taken over by, by Soviet army. So uh, that should be my next feature film. Well, that's very interesting. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, because that's the history that has not been yet uh, portrayed, I think, enough in films uh, that period. 
and good luck in the Academy Award competition. Nice to talk. <laughs> nice to talk. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you.